Okay, welcome to section 4.1, maximum and minimum values. So in this section, we're gonna examine how derivatives affect the shape of a graph of a function and how they help us locate maximum and minimum values. So some definitions first, absolute maximum. We say a function f has an absolute maximum at c if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x's that are in the domain of f, meaning there are no function values or no y values that are larger than f of c on the function's domain. Absolute minimum. A function has an absolute minimum at k if f of k is less than or equal to f of x for all x's that are in the domain or an element of the domain of f. Local or relative maximum. A function f has a local maximum at b if f of b is greater than or equal to f of x when x is near b. What exactly does near mean? Another version of this definition um, you might see it would say in an open interval containing b. So it won't specify exactly what the distance is, but there needs to be some open interval that contains B where your local max occurs. And local or relative minimum, a function F has a local, oh, this should say minimum, at M. If F of M is less than or equal to F of X, when X is near M, or we could say in an open interval containing M. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, so let's look at a graph here and see if we can apply the definitions and locate all of the absolute and local maxes and mins or extrema. Sometimes you'll see them referred to as extrema if it's a max or a min. Okay. So first things first, what pops out at you? Well, right here, f of b, that's a local max, right? It's the largest value of the graph near or on an open interval containing b. It's not the largest function value I see on the entire graph, correct? So it's not going to be an absolute max. Okay, let's come over here to the next point, f of c is a local min, right? It's the smallest function value on this little neighborhood or open interval. Um, f of d, that's nothing. Notice, you might think, oh, it looks like a min, or maybe you think it looks like a max. That's the problem. So it's the smallest y value for function values to its right, but it's the largest function values if you're approaching from the left. So that's nothing then. So sorry. Okay. Here at E, f of E is a local max. Again, it's the largest function value in an open interval containing E. Um, moving on, f of f also looks like it's a local min. But that's not all. Isn't it the smallest function value on the entire graph? That also makes it an absolute min. And then moving on, here, f of g, well, it can't be a local max because there is no open interval containing g. It's an endpoint, but it is the absolute max of the function. And this leads us to a very important point because that's why also notice f of a was nothing, right? It's not a local min or something like that. Because an endpoint cannot be a local min or max. And if you think of that definition, that a local min or max has to have an open interval around it or containing it, then it basically has a neighborhood of function values around it. So it has to have neighbors to the left and neighbors to the right, meaning it cannot be an endpoint. So let's write that down. Note. Endpoints 
are not considered for local max or min values. All right, endpoints can be absolute max or min values, but never local. Just think they have no neighbors on one side. Okay, let's move on to another example here. Sketch the graph of f to find the absolute and local max and min values of f. Another way you might see this problem worded is to find the local extrema. That means the same thing. That's just a way of saying max and min at the same time. Okay, so let's look at this function here. We have a parabola, right? And it's been shifted one unit to the left and one unit upwards. And then our domain's restricted from negative two to two. So here's my x-axis, here's my y-axis. I'll scale the x-axis by two, since we don't have to sketch too much there, but the y values are gonna increase a little more rapidly. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Perfect. All right, so f of negative two, let's see what we're gonna get. So f of negative two, that's gonna be one plus negative two plus one squared. So that's gonna be two. So f of negative two is two. f of negative one, that's gonna be one plus zero squared. So that's one. And then f of zero, that's gonna be one plus one squared. So that's two f of 1, that's going to be 1 plus 2 squared, so 5. And then f of 2 is going to be 1 plus 3 squared, which is 10. But notice here, x is strictly less than 2. So what does that mean? Well, I'm going to plot an open circle at 10, okay? So here's my parabola, no arrows, right? Since the domain's restricted. Beautiful. All right, so let's use this graph now. We're gonna find the absolute and local extrema. So I'm gonna list out all four options. So absolute max, absolute min, any local maxes, and you can always have more than one of absolute or local, so they don't have to be unique. All right, do we have an absolute max? Do we have a largest function value? No, in this case, there is not one. Since we have an open circle here at 10, there is no function value that we could say is the largest. And you might say, well, what about 9.9? Well, I can always find something larger that's on the graph. How about 9.99? Oh, well, why doesn't that work for the absolute max? Well, what about 9.999? So this could go on forever. So there's no absolute max because we have an open circle at 10. Is there an absolute min? Is there a value on the graph that's the smallest function value on the entire interval? Well, in this case, yes, right here. So you want to write it out as follows. You always want to identify where it occurs. So we'll write f of negative 1, indicating that it occurs when x is negative 1, and that equals 1. So that min value is 1. Are there any local maxes? I don't see any, right? So there's none. Are there any local mins? Well, our absolute min also happens to be a local min, right? Isn't it the smallest y value on an open interval of values near negative 1? So we would say f of negative 1, which is 1, is also a local min. Okay, so there's some exercises in the homework where you're going to have to graph a function and then identify the following, and not in every case will it have absolute and local extrema, or it might have more than one for some cases. All right, moving on, next idea is the extreme value theorem. If f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, then f attains absol an absolute maximum value f of c and an absolute minimum value f of d, 
where C and D are elements of the interval from A to B. So notice we have two conditions in order to apply the extreme value theorem. We require continuity of our function as well as a closed interval. And then what the extreme value theorem tells us is that I'm guaranteed to find an absolute max and an absolute min on this interval. Well, why is this so powerful? Let's think of another parabola, perhaps. Okay, just our basic parent function y equals x squared. Okay, if I look at y equals x squared, well, it's continuous, right? It's a polynomial. But I'm not going to consider a closed interval from a to b. I'm just going to consider y equals x squared on its entire domain of all real numbers. Do I have an absolute max? No, right? There isn't one because the function extends upward forever. So infinity cannot be an absolute max. We have to have a finite function value. Is there an absolute min? Yes, right here at the vertex. So f of 0, which is 0. So I haven't applied the extreme value theorem because I didn't consider the function on a closed interval. So what if I do that now? Notice what changes. So y equals x squared, and I'm only going to consider it on the interval from a to b. It doesn't matter where a and b is or where they are. Okay, so here's my parabola. And say I'm going to put a here, b here. All right, now I'm only going to consider the function on the interval from a to b. Do I have an absolute max? Only looking at the portion of the parabola from a to b. Why, yes, right here at the end point. So f of b or b squared is my absolute max. Do I have an absolute min? Yes, still at f of 0. So basically what the extreme value theorem tells us is if we have a continuous function and we restrict the domain to a closed interval, we can find both an absolute max and min. We'll see why this is so powerful in just a moment. Now for Moss theorem, if f has a local max or min value at c, and if f prime of c exists, then f prime of c is equal to zero. And you may have noticed this before. Basically, if you have a local min or a local max, and you try to draw a tangent line at that min or max value, what is the slope of that tangent line? Well, it's always horizontal, right? So the slope is going to be zero. And that's what Fermat's theorem tells us. Great. So now this leads us to a very important idea of critical numbers. And as long as C is in the domain of our function, don't forget that part, we say C is a critical number if one of the following two conditions is true. F prime of C equals zero, or if F prime of C does not exist. And note, if f has a local max or min at c, then c is a critical number of f. So basically, our local extrema are a subset of the critical numbers. If we have a local max or min, then it occurs at a critical number of the function. The reverse statement is not true. Not all critical numbers are local maxes or mins, but we'll talk about how to figure out which ones are later on in the chapter. Okay, so let's look at an example now. Find the critical numbers of h of p, which equals p minus 1 over p squared plus 4. So remember, our criteria for critical numbers are they occur where the derivative equals 0 or where the derivative does not exist. So what this means is we need to find h prime of p and then solve for where h prime of p equals 0, as well as where h prime of p does not exist. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and find the derivative first. H of P is P minus 1 over P squared plus 4. So we're going to need to apply the quotient rule. Here we go. So H prime of P is going to equal, we have low D high. So low, just the denominator. D high, derivative of P minus 1 is 1. Minus high, P minus 1. D low, derivative of P squared plus 4 is 2P. Over low, low. So P squared plus 4 squared. Oop, that needs to be parentheses. Okay, now let's clean this up. So we're going to have P squared plus 4 minus, now this is going to distribute 2P squared plus 2P all over P squared plus 4 quantity squared. Beautiful. And then combining like terms, I have negative p squared plus 2p plus 4 over the quantity p squared plus 4 squared. So there's our derivative. Now in order to find the critical numbers, I need to do two things. First, find where h prime of p equals 0 as well as where h prime of p does not exist. I recommend you write these two conditions out first so you don't forget. Okay, well the derivative is going to equal zero when the numerator of h prime of p equals zero, right? So we're just going to set the numerator equal to zero. So negative p squared plus 2p plus 4 is zero. So we need to apply the quadratic formula. Let's just hit this thing with a negative one though. So you, you never want that leading coefficient to be negative. P squared minus two P minus four is zero. So that means P, that doesn't factor, does it? No, so quadratic formula time it is. P equals opposite of B plus or minus square root B squared minus four A C all over so this is going to be 2 plus or minus the square root of, let's see, that's going to be 4 plus 16 over 2. So that's 2 plus or minus rad 20 over 2, which is 2 plus or minus 2 rad 5 over 2, which is 1 plus or minus rad 5. Okay, so those are two critical values right there, 1 plus rad 5 and 1 minus rad 5. Now, to find where the derivative does not exist, that would happen if the denominator was equal to 0. So I'm going to set the denominator equal to 0. So we set p squared plus 4 squared equal to 0. Well, taking the square root of both sides, that would mean p squared plus 4 equals 0, which means p squared would equal negative 4. But that's not possible. So this case doesn't yield any critical values. But I do have some from where h prime of p equals 0. So those are the only two critical numbers that we found. 1 plus or minus rad 5. All right. Nice job. That concludes part one.